Hello everybody, good evening. I am hoping that I'm live and you'll be able to see me. Um, welcome, my name is Hannah Morris and I'm an educational psychologist. Um, I'm going to be live this evening talking about the role of an educational psychologist and answering your questions about educational psychology assessments. The first thing I wanted to talk about was basically what is psychology because to be able to explain the role of an educational psychologist you need to know a little bit about psychology. Um, so basically psychologists are scientists and what that means is we test theories um, through experiments and use our knowledge of what we find and use our knowledge of research to help understand the people that we work with and of course how to help them with anything that they're worried about or any issues they've got going on. So the sorts of questions that we ask as part of our research, and this is research going back centuries, um, but obviously uh, we're always looking to um, update ourselves with the most recent research and part of our role as psychologists is we have a responsibility to keep updated um, in our practice in making sure that we have a, a clear understanding of how we understand um, what we know about uh, people's learning and development and interactions. So, some of the questions that we might ask as psychologists are things like, how do our brains work and affect what we do? How do we form relationships? Um, how do our experiences affect us? So what are the links between what we think and what we feel? And this is a big one for children and young people um, because often their emotions are at the forefront of, of what's going on and sort of interlinked with, with anything that's preventing them from making progress at school. Um, and of course, how do we learn? What affects our learning? What are the barriers to a child's learning? And what's going to help them learn and access the curriculum and be able to um, uh, make progress and, and achieve and be successful in their education? So the role of an educational psychologist is to understand a child's learning, development and behaviour in relation to their education. And we do this through all sorts of different methods, um, but in particular, we might um, uh, start off by exploring early experiences. For example, were there any delays with the child's language or motor skills? What was their attachment like as, as babies and, and young children? We're also going to want to gather the child's view as well, because to be able to fully understand what's going on, we need to be able to see the child's world through their eyes and get their, their perspective, even if it doesn't quite make sense to adults um, or um, we think it might be wrong, might not be true. We need to know what the child thinks and what their perception is. Um, and actually, sometimes children don't really understand their own perceptions anyway. Um, so it can be a really valuable part of, of the work that we do to explore the child's view and make sure everybody understands how they're seeing things. Um, we're interested in looking at the environment, looking at um, the child's classroom environment, playground, where they transition from corridors to um, just moving around a, a large building from the office to the, um, to the toilets. Um, all sorts of things happen in a child's environment and their experiences of their environment um, that can have a really big impact on their experiences at school. Um, and then we're also looking at relationships, relationships with adults, relationships with peers. Um, many educational psychologists will take the time to explore a child's feelings because how a child feels emotionally can have a big impact on their brain functioning. So, for example, we know that um, worries and anxiety affect the brain's ability to maintain attention and to use memory skills. And then at the heart of the, at the assessment is often, um, we're often looking at two areas. The first is what we call intelligence. So this is our ability to understand, learn and reason, so problem solving. Um, and reasoning is, is the ability, it means thinking about something in a logical way and considering possible options to solve a problem. And then we have cognition, and um, this is the mental process of thinking and knowing. It's how our mind takes information in through the senses and, and sorts and classifies that information, storing it so that we can uh, retain it and remember it, either in the short or long term. Um, some educational psychologists might also explore other areas of development that may be relevant, such as social and motor skills. 
So I'm just going to pause here um, and take a look and uh, just see how we're going with the comments and questions. Um, please do um, drop me a note, um, say hi, let me know a little bit about uh, who's watching, do your ch children have any particular special education needs or to their ages? Um, and um, if you have any questions, type them in the comments um, because after I've finished talking a little bit about the role of the educational psychologist, um, I am going to go through the questions um, and uh, answer them and in particular looking at educational psychology assessment. So what do you want to know about an educational psychology assessment? Perhaps you have one coming up, um, perhaps um, you're thinking of having an educational psychology assessment, so what do you want to know? Um, so uh, let's carry on now looking a little bit about the role of the EP and I should just say to clarify here, educational psychologist, sometimes it's shortened to EP, E for educational, P for psychologist, or ed psych. Um, so if you hear those phrases, it's all one and the same. Okay, so um, let's have a little think about where do EPs work and who with. Um, just bear me in one second. Okay, so all, basically EPs work with, with all ages, um, not just children, uh, adults can have assessments by an educational psychologist as well. Um, personally, I work with children aged three to 16 years. Um, but we work in lots of different settings, some of which may sort of surprise you or you may not have, have sort of been aware of. Um, EPs work in local, local authorities, um, used to be called local education authorities. Um, often today working in multidisciplinary teams with lots of other professionals such as advisory teachers. Um, EPs work in independent practice. So um, uh, this means basically we don't work for any uh, necessarily any local authority. We might work for an organisation as sort of part of a team that is in what you might call private practice, but um, we, we don't uh, we're not employed uh, by anybody that is not sort of an educational psychologist. Um, but EPs also are often working in different settings, maybe as part of a multidisciplinary team, or perhaps they've been seconded somewhere. So um, thinking about children's centres. Um, and obviously we, we go into schools and nurseries, colleges, universities, um, but also the youth justice service, um, hospitals, uh, social services, um, all these places. I remember when I worked for, for a local authority, I um, worked for a while with um, social services looking at how to help children in care um, and think about raising their educational attainment. So the, the role is really diverse, it's really varied. Um, but what do we actually do? Uh, well, <laughs> um, lots. <laughs> so every educational psychologist works differently. And one thing I would really recommend you do if you're thinking of having an EP assessment is have a conversation, whether it's phoning or email in advance, and just ask the EP how they work. What is it they do? Whether you're employing someone independently or you know someone, um, an EP from the local authority is going to be working with your child, contact them and find out what actually is going to happen. Um, I'm going to talk through the range of different types of work that we do so that you can um, have sort of a sense of the different different ways we work and hopefully that will be helpful to you. So um, EPs will often do observations of children in school to get a sense of how um, they are experiencing um, their education, but also looking at what's going well for them, not just the problems. We, it, we will know from gathering background information that um, from what schools tell us, what parents tell us, if, if there are concerns and there are issues. And, and we, um, whilst uh, we always approach our work with an open mind, um, it can be really helpful to try and find out some of the things that are working well for a child in their setting, because that's a really useful start to, um, to build on. Um, but also it can help with understanding um, a child's difficulties better. Sometimes the adults close to a child might have a view that there is something happening in particular, um, but um, 
but some but but there can be other things going on that that have maybe not been noticed um and being able to sort of sit back um as an outsider um and just watch with no responsibilities of teaching in the classroom um can be really powerful um so the other thing I wanted to say was that um, educational psychologists tend to, to work in two particular ways. The first is a consultation approach, and sometimes EPs build in elements of consultation, which is basically a discussion um, in their work, but um, the, the, the actual consultation approach is supposed to be a plan, do and review approach. So if, if an educational psychologist is using this approach, typically they will have an initial consultation, do a bit of problem solving with you using different psychological techniques and questioning. Then um, there's an action plan put into place. Ideally, then the actions are carried out. And then um, you meet again and you review it, maybe do a bit more problem solving and maybe the cycle continues. It can be difficult to for this process to happen in full because of limited resources. Um, so just bear that in mind. If you are being offered a consultation, just ask about that whole process. You know, is there going to be a review? What's going to happen so that, that you're not sort of left hanging after just, just a meeting? And then educational psychologists do assessments. And again, every EP works differently and has access to different materials and depending on what their team has purchased or what they've purchased. Um, and also in, in terms of the, their practice and, and the way they work, their experience, things like that. Um, there's often an element of assessment. What, I, I'll be completely honest, it's, it's got nothing to do with the experience of an educational psychologist or their qualifications. But in reality, um, if an EP is working in a local authority, they are very limited for time. Resources are very limited. So the chances of them being able to carry out a full assessment are going to be small. Um, just to give you an idea, I currently spend about two days of time in total, the whole the whole start to finish with a child, and I'll be explaining a bit more in a minute. Um, I will usually spend about two days per child. When I work for local authorities, I may have had five mornings a year for one school. So that just gives you a sense of the, the challenges and why it can be very difficult um, to access EP input. But what I would say is that if you are requesting an education, health and care plan assessment, then the local authority educational psychologist has to become involved. Um, so it, it may be that if you have been struggling for a long time, um, that, that that is a, a route that you want to go down. It's not the reason, it's not why we should be requesting EHTPs, but unfortunately it's it's how some families are accessing them at the moment. Um, if you are at the start of your journey and you want to know a bit more about what to do and where to go and how to help, I am doing um, a hub a consultation tomorrow evening at eight o'clock and I think there are still a couple of places left um, so that the information on that is on my page and on my, on my group. Um, you're very welcome to join if you want to discuss your child in, in more detail. Um, so the, the actual assessment um, process varies. I always cover um, the intelligence and cognition side which I mentioned at the beginning and then I'll explore any other areas of concern whether it's social skills, motor development, emotional needs, attention um, attention and concentration. Whilst I can diagnose learning difficulties, I can't diagnose things like autism and ADHD. Um, some psychologists take extra training to be able to do that. Um, but I will, I can screen and I will always advise if I think a, a formal assessment is helpful. But also, um, the most important part is it doesn't matter about a diagnosis. If a child has particular difficulties and they're identified in an EP assessment, then I'll always make recommendations for, for what can be put in place to help them at school. Um, the other elements of our report writing include, uh, of our work include um, report writing, um, and uh, this can be quite a time consuming part of our job. Uh, we can't be paperwork shy, um, but we have to make sure that we're communicating the results of what's often quite complex assessments um, that everybody can understand that also everybody will be willing to acknowledge and take on board. So we're, we're not necessarily just writing for parents, we're writing for teachers as well, um, we're writing for healthcare professionals who may look at a report further down the line. Um, but crucial certainly to, in my practice is, is the belief, is my belief that understanding is, is really at the heart of 
of what I do. And so as my clients, um, which is I say 95% of the time it's, it's parents um, who will be paying for my services, my my job is to answer your questions um, and to help you understand your child and how to um, know what to do to help your child. So um, the report writing part element is, is an important part of that so that those answers to your questions are clearly communicated. Um, as I said, we make diagnosis if there's a specific learning difficulty such as dyslexia or dyscalculia. So dyslexia is a difficulty um, with the processing memory and language skills that affect a child's ability to um, learn to, to recognise letters and read words. And dyscalculia is a child's difficulty in developing the, the fundamental um, an understanding of the fundamental concepts of maths that uh, affect their ability to, to learn and develop math skills. Um, we can also diagnose moderate learning difficulties, which is where a child has general difficulties across the board in their intelligence um, in particular, and then um, uh, also in what we call maladaptive behaviours, so life skills and being able to carry out daily tasks and socialise with others, level of maturity, things like that. Um, some educational psychologists will do assessments for tribunals and attend tribunals. We carry out training, um, a bit like GPs, we sort of have, have a knowledge and understanding of everything. And whilst we may develop particular specialisms in certain areas, um, we have to have a knowledge and understanding of, of all areas of child development and learning because every child is different and unique. Um, so um, training covers all areas and um, EPs will tend to, say, have specialisms and maybe develop training in areas that they're particularly interested in. But also if, if, if a school um, or an organisation asks for a particular type of training, then, then we, we can develop it. Um, some EPs engage in project work, research, um, some do extra training in therapeutic work, um, and some um, uh, are published, um, they publish books, they're in the media, um, publish uh, research articles. So it's really, really quite a broad role. Okay, just bear with me a moment, have a sip of water. So before I talk about my personal assessment process, to give you an understanding of, of how I work, um, uh, for some reason the, the comments are now not coming up on my screen, but my wonderful husband is writing all your questions down for me, so I'm going to go through them. Um, unfortunately, I don't know who has written the comments and questions this stage, but um, I'm just going to have a look here. Um, so somebody said that, that your, your son's had a private educational psychology assessment in January. Um, you've had a speech and language therapy and an occupational therapy report, um, but um, didn't quite get enough information from speech and language therapy because at the time you weren't thinking about an education, health and care plan. You are having another speech and language therapy assessment in April, which is good. Should you ask her to wait to complete the report to include the new speech and language therapy report or leave as it is thinking about tribunal? So this is a sort of a bit of a bigger question because it really relates to the EHCP and tribunal processes. Um, there's two answers. The first answer is if you want to understand your child's needs and what they want, then um, you do that straight away. The reality is that many EHCPs don't get agreed. Many parents end up at tribunal and you're probably better off waiting to get that detailed report at tribunal. If the speech therapist is willing to talk to you verbally um, and maybe even put some things in place in the meantime, um, then you may be better off waiting for a if you're going to be going to tribunal. Um, I can't tell you exactly what you, you should or shouldn't do. That's a, a personal decision, um, but that is the reality for some families. Not all. Some will get an EHCP um, agreed. What I would say is I'm not going to talk too much about that process now because I did a Facebook Live um, a couple of weeks ago. You can see it. It's in my events on my work page. It's in this group. Um, uh, if you look at, I think it's under announcements, you can find it. And we, we did a whole session on EHCPs and tribunals with the wonderful Dr. Michael Hymans, who is an expert witness and a very experienced psychologist. So please take a look at that if you are anywhere in the EHCP process um, and if you're considering whether you may need to go to tribunal. Um, his, his, the information shared was invaluable. Um, so I really recommend, I recommend that. Um, right, I'm going to grab the questions that my husband's been Popping on the table for me. Okay, can an EP work out if a child is anxious at school? Um, yes. Um, what I would say is we 
we can't wave that magic wand to um, always be able to know everything that's going on um, but we are trained to understand emotions in children how they present in children and the factors that can can contribute um, and we we also are trained to understand that sometimes anxiety doesn't show at school sometimes it doesn't present i'm thinking here particularly children with neurodiversity who may do what's called masking at school where they try really really hard to manage and cope with everything they're finding overwhelming and stressful and then what happens is they go home um, and it all comes out and they have a big meltdown um, but there are also assessment tools that we use to identify um, whether a child may have heightened levels of anxiety. Um, so yes, it is something that, that an educational psychologist can do. If you're looking for something more in depth, then you would want a clinical psychologist. So for example, if you wanted to someone to explore anxiety in detail and offer maybe therapeutic support, um, but certainly when, when I explore children's emotions, if I feel that they would benefit from further assessment, any therapeutic input, I'll always say that and put that as a recommendation. Um, Next question, um, this person's son was diagnosed with ADHD as well as specific learning difficulties. What does this mean? Okay, so I will answer a question, but, but before I do, what I want to say is, and I, and I want to say this so loudly to, to everybody watching, if you have had any information from any professional that you don't understand what it means, please, please go back and ask them. Drop them an email phone them, they will not mind. It is their professional responsibility to ensure that you understand what they're communicating. So if you've read something in a, in a report about your child and you don't know what that means, then ask the professional to explain it to you. I'll often have phone conversations um, after parents have read reports that I've written and go through certain things that, um, as much as I tried my best to um, make it as clear as possible, sometimes there's so much information and it's so overwhelming that it, that it can be tricky to, to sort of get it right all the time in terms of how I'm communicating it. But I'm always happy to talk through um, and um, explain things if they are confusing um, or don't make quite make sense. So please go back. But what this basically means is that your child has um, what some people call complex specific learning difficulties. So um, they have difficulties in more than one area. But, but coexisting just means that they have both. So your child has difficulties um, in terms of being able to so ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So that's difficulties in, in how it's how the brain is formed, it's how the brain functions, and your child has difficulty knowing what information to attend to. Um, and it can they it, it, ADHD can present with all sorts of symptoms from being very daydreamy and withdrawn and struggling to focus to being um, super stimulated, hundred million thoughts going on in the mind difficulty regulating emotions, difficulty planning an organisation, sense of, of time, being able to plan ahead. So that's the, the ADHD part. And specific learning difficulties are when a child has specific difficulties. So it's not general. It's not that um, across the board intellectually they are always going to struggle and be delayed. It means they have a, a specific difficulty in certain areas um, and that if in school those difficulties are accommodated for perhaps um, uh, through differentiated teaching approaches and additional targeted teaching, um, then your child should still be able to, to make progress and achieve in education. So examples of specific learning difficulties would be dyslexia and dyscalculia, maybe a specific language difficulty. Um, again, go back to the person who did the assessment, ask them exactly what they mean by that, because um, you need to know so that you can make sure that the uh, best approaches are, are being focused on to put support in place. Um, next question, what is the difference between an emotional assessment and a behavioural assessment? Oh, I like that question. Okay. Now, I'm talking as an educational psychologist here. Clinical psychologists may have certain assessment tools they use. Um, essentially, there is no difference. <laughs> Here's why. In my, my view, the way I see things, um, I never assess for behaviours because behaviours are a child's way of communicating something or a child's way of coping. So whatever behaviours we're seeing, whether it is a child 
um, very angry and throwing chairs across the classroom, whether it is physical aggression, whether it is bouncing up and down because we're super excited, whether it is giving a hug um, because we're very affectionate. Behaviours are a child's way of communicating and coping. So feelings and emotions are integral to that. Um, so basically, there, there isn't really a difference. What a, an educational psychologist will do is be looking to try to understand how the child's emotions are impacting their behaviour and their presentation at school because that is likely hindering their ability to access the curriculum and learn. Um, so that's sort of the, the main reason for it. If, if a clinical psychologist was working with the child, they were probably looking at it from the point of view of helping the child and the family have more positive relationships um, for the child to be able to express those emotions more appropriately. And as an educational psychologist, when we're making recommendations, we're going to be um, very much tailoring them to what the school can do to help the child recognise, understand and cope with their emotions. Um, but also a bit about what you can be doing at home as well, because it often helps to have sort of joined up approaches. Um, and I have a, another question. I'll do one more question and then I'll carry on talking a little bit and then I'll do a few more. Um, this question is, your, your son's not been in school since June 2019. I'm really sorry to hear that. That is absolutely unacceptable. Um, he had two panic attacks in school, um, and when I say unacceptable, I don't mean from your point of view, I mean that uh, that he's not been able to, to ha access a provision to meet his needs. Um, there was a build-up, um, and he was only managing 50 minutes in school, um, so it was unlikely he could be observed in school. How would that work for an assessment? Okay, so the, the observation part of an assessment, um, for, for me, is... A small part. So I wouldn't worry too much if your child can't be observed in school. Um, there are other ways to observe things like social skills and um, interactions, and the educational psychologist will judge what's the best approach. Um, again, every EP works differently. So I stopped working during lockdown, whereas I've got colleagues who have been doing virtual assessments. What I would say is the important thing to, to focus on is the actual assessment because that's where the EP is going to get the, the, um, the majority of the, of the information that they need. Um, it's not to say that um, observations are not helpful, not useful, not important, but um, really the, the assessment part is the important part and many EPs would and in my opinion should work flexibly um, so for example going to your home to do the assessment instead of at school um, as I said doing it virtually if, if that's how they've chosen to work during lockdown um, but maybe it would help at this point if I talk a little bit about my assessment process to give you a sense of sort of, of what's involved so the, as I said in total it's about two days of time um, for, for a child that that I would work with. Um, that doesn't mean I'm working with them in individually all that time. This is, and it's not necessarily two solid days, it's sort of spread out through the whole process of from the moment I'm contacted to when um, that uh, report goes out and, um, and we ensure that it's all fully understood. So the first part is the information gathering part. So this is where um, I would ask uh, parents and schools to fill in background information. The reason I insist on the child's school or nursery or college filling in a form. I won't ass work uh, and assess a child if I don't have the school input. If a child's not um, enrolled, if they're home educated, that doesn't count, that's fine. But if your child's attending an educational provision, then they, I, I will ask for um, them to complete a, a, a background information form. Um, the reason I do this is that, first of all, it's helpful for me to understand if there are different perspectives, which Sometimes there are between schools and parents. That's okay. Um, I just need to have an understanding. Um, I also need to know what's been put in place at school um, and uh, what particular programs have been used from, again, from the school's perspective. I need to know what they have tried um, and what they've put in place. I know sometimes parents will say to me, but this really hasn't happened. Again, that's okay. I can acknowledge that, but I, I, I just need to know the different perspectives. Um, also, and, and this is quite important, when I am going to, um, to give a report to parents and then as parents and carers are going to share it with the school, um, I want the school to A, feel they've been part of the process and B, um, take on board what I'm saying and um, 
have a positive approach, particularly as I'm an independent practitioner. So involving everyone from the start means it can be a job, more of a joined up process um, and uh, that's more likely to happen. Um, I won't always observe children if, for example, um, uh, your concern is just about dyslexia. I don't need to see your child in class to know whether they've got dyslexia or not. I can do that through the um, through the assessment. So I don't necessarily need to observe every child. Um, but if I do, um, that is something I'll, I'll usually spend about an hour and I will literally just sit at the back of the classroom. Sometimes I go on watch on the playground as well um, and just do an observation, looking for what's working well for the child, where there are difficulties, thinking about the environment, their relationships between the teachers um, and, and the pupils. Um, sometimes I get an interesting snapshot of a transition between lessons. Um, so it's just whatever I get on the day is useful information to add. Because as psychologists, we we try to do something called triangulation. And this is where, there's my little triangle for you, this is where we're looking for three pieces of information that um, support our conclusion for something. So if I, um, for example, um, have concerns that a child uh, may have autism, and I might do a screener as part of the assessment, I might be told from uh, parents about certain behaviours and presentations during their early development and then when I'm at school I might be um, noticing things in their interactions with their peers so again it helps with that process of being able to triangulate and add, add an extra layer of, of information. When I do the assessment I use a range of standardised assessments as, um, as well as different psychological techniques so if something is standardised, it means it's been tested formally using a very specific approach that is the same for all children that it's been tested on. And the tests that psychologists use have been standardised on thousands of children from all sorts of different backgrounds with all sorts of abilities. So when I get a, a, a score, when I get a result and it tells me that um, a child um, has uh, average um, skills in being able to process what they see uh, at an appropriate speed for their age. Um, I know that um, that that result comes from testing lots and lots of other children. Similarly, if I'm seeing severe difficulties or exceptional abilities in any particular skill, um, maths or uh, verbal reasoning, or memory, anything at all, I, I know that it's been that the test itself has been really um, thoroughly um, explored as, as part of its development. But there's always room for error. So there's, um, we're, we're always mindful as psychologists, and um, it's actually part of the assessment scores that we're given, is that a child can perform differently on different days. So um, we're always mindful that there can be a slight difference there. But what, what our job as psychologists is, as educational psychologists, is to take all the information, the assessment information, anything from observations, um, background information, anything I may observe whilst I'm working with a child, their views. Um, and when I say assessment information, as I said before, just to remind you, intelligence, cognition, literacy, maths, I will always explore literacy and maths, and then anything else that's a, a concern. Um, emotional needs, social skills, attention skills, motor skills. Not all psychologists work this way, so ask your EP what they're going to do, but <clears throat> this is what I do. And then I gather all that information together and I analyze it in context. So what that means is I don't just look at a score and I don't just look at what one person said, I look at it all together. And then I can, <clears throat> excuse me, inform my conclusions um, about what's, what's um, going on for the child. So Strengths is really important. I always try to highlight the child's strengths. Um, they're important to build upon. Um, but obviously, if, if you're seeking an educational psychology assessment, it's likely that you're concerned about um, how your child's doing at school. So um, a huge chunk is obviously about what their difficulties are and then crucially recommendations for what can help. When I make recommendations, I focus on in-class teaching approaches as well as resources. Um, and um, I'm very specific. So again, ask the educational psychologist you're working with, will they be specific in saying if your child needs a certain number of hours of support and particular types of programs? Wishy-washy language isn't going to help you, your, the teachers or your child. Um, they need some, some specific guidance that is really well evidence-based. 
Um, make sure if there's an assessment done that the scores are included in your report um, and that you ask the person who's done the assessment to explain them to you and to make sure the explanations are in the report as well. And then the last bit is that communication, as I said earlier, making sure that everyone understands what's written. Um, and sometimes I will have um, uh, consultations before and after as well, a bit of problem solving, um, planning what, what we're going to do, reviewing it, making sure everybody understands, maybe sometimes trying to shift perspectives, um, help people get a better understanding. Um, but what I tend to find is that even if resources are limited and schools can't put everything in place, certainly from the teacher's perspectives, it's really helpful for them getting an understanding of how your child learns and what they can do, how they can adapt their approaches to help your child in their class. Um, so basically our job is, is to help others understand why a child is having difficulty and how they can be taught to help them make progress. It's important that your child knows their strengths but also why they might find some things hard. Um, again, this is why I'm so passionate about the role of the educational psychologist because so many times if children are struggling at school, they will self-label because they don't understand. So maybe they'll say they're stupid and they think they can't learn at all, when actually it's a specific learning difficulty and it might be that they're really intelligent. Um, so whilst a label um, is helpful for that understanding, it also doesn't tell us about um, the child as a person and who they are um, and it also doesn't tell us about what their profile is so again it's not enough for me to say your child has dyslexia your child has um, uh, difficulty with with working memory which is um, your ability to hold information in mind for a short period of time and work with it um, I need to explain and break that down you know are we talking auditory information or visual information if your child has dyslexia well how does that affect them is it with letters is it with at the word level is it reading is it spelling um and, and all the other things that go with it language and memory as well so um it's really important that if you are trying to understand um your child whether you're just not sure or whether you think your child may have a particular condition, make sure you ask the person doing the assessment, will you explain what that means for my child? What's my child's profile? Um, you know, will it be detailed? Will it be clear? Um, and obviously, um, it's important that um, an educational psychologist uh, helps you understand how to help your child, what interventions, what strategies, what support is going to make a difference for them. Um, I think we've had another couple of questions coming in. Um, so, <laughs> my husband's just written a note saying, loads of questions coming through. Great, this is what we want. Okay, let me grab some of these questions. Um, your 10 year old is due an educational psychology report in a few weeks. Um, we've asked for a reassessment of needs. So you want an understanding of the child's needs at this point in time. Um, She's got ADHD and global developmental delay. Will we be able to find out her current cognitive ability? Um, in, ter in terms of what's possible, yes, but you have to go back to that um, EP that's doing the assessment and ask them if that's something that they're going to cover. And, and a great way to have conversations with professionals is to write down questions, write down things that you want to know. So rather than phoning up and saying, I want you to do this, Write down questions. I'd like to know my child's current cognitive ability. Um, will you be able to, to help me understand that? Will you be able to tell me what this is? Um, you know, I'd like to know why my child struggles um, with writing. Will you be able to answer that question for me? Um, I know my child um, has difficulties processing information and they have autism. Um, will you be Giving, be able to help me know what what should be put in place at school. What what should what what will good practice look like? What will the good teaching look like and the differentiation look like? Um, you know what what should the school be doing? Will you be able to help me understand that? Next question. Um, your this is a child who's got uh, quite complex needs: autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, and hypermobile. My son is also hypermobile. Very very bendy. A lot of um, athletes and uh, Gymnasts are hypermobile. Um, you've got to have, have good good strength as well. Unfortunately, my son has low muscle tone, so um, he doesn't have that uh, strong uh, core strength side of it. But the really successful athletes and um, gymnasts often are really, really strong and hypermobile. Um, so uh, 
there's, that, that's a positive there. Whilst handwriting might be a nightmare, um, it can have its, its benefits. Um, so this child is in the needs assessment process. Um, you've had advisory teachers and speech language therapists involved and say they see a lot of anxiety, sequencing issues. Yeah, dislikes literacy. I can I can understand why, and school school refusing. Sorry to hear that. It's um, it, you know, it, if anxiety isn't addressed early, it can lead to school refusal. Um, and the local education, the local authority EP is assessing on Tuesday what tests should she be doing. Um, so my advice to you would be to find out. First of all, if they are definitely going to be doing an assessment, um, sometimes the local authority EP will be involved and, and you'll be told that, that they're going in. I mean, you have to give permission. An EP can't work with the child without your permission so that you should have been asked to sign something um, like a referral form or something. But um, find out exactly what they're going to do, first of all, because don't assume that it will be an assessment. Um, it might not be. Um, you could ask how long they're planning to be there for and that'll give you a sense of what they're able to do. Um, in terms of what should they be doing, so educational psychologists have a responsibility to work in accordance with the ethical guidelines and best practice of the British Psychological Society and the Health and Care Professions Council. However, this isn't prescriptive about what tests we should use. Um, so if the purpose of the assessment is to get an understanding of um, what can help your child at school. The local authority EP, if they're limited for time, might choose a particular approach that doesn't involve many assessments because if their time is limited, they want to maximise the help they can give. So it might be that they focus on um, a couple of areas and work with the teachers in better helping them better understand how they can support your child. Um, in terms of um, if it was me that was doing this assessment, I would be doing a full assessment. I'd be looking at intelligence, I'd be looking at um, processing, um, memory, literacy, maths, I'd be I'd be exploring social skills, motor skills, everything. Um, but I have a wide range of, of tests that I use for that and, and I'm independent so I have the time to do that as well. Um, if they are going to do um, a one of the core tests that psychologists will tend to do is they'll, if they are going to do an assessment, they'll tend to look at elements of intelligence and processing and memory and literacy and maths. They might not do full the full assessment, just dip into key parts. But the names of the, there's two main types of assessments that um, educational psychologists use. And actually clinical psychologists, there's an overlap. They, they can also use these assessments, but um, obviously educational psychologists have the um, understanding of um, education systems to, to make recommendations from an assessment for how to help um, a child in school rather than just necessarily giving a diagnosis. Um, but the two main assessments, one is called the British Ability Scales and the other is called the Weschler Intelligence Scales, the WIS and the BAS. Um, and um, then there's also Within the BAS, there's um, literacy and math skills, and another assessment that's linked with that that looks at reading comprehension is called the YARC, which is the York Assessment of Reading Comprehension. So they tend to go together. Um, and then the WIAT tends to be used with, with the WISC, which is the Weschler. Um, it's, it's a test of achievement um, uh, uh, skills, so, so it's the literacy and math side of things. So those are sort of two of the main tests that there's there's no right or wrong test to use it's very much down to the psychologist's preference perhaps what's available for them if they work for a local authority um and um they're just standardized by dif developed by different companies basically um but but essentially they, they cover the same thing they're just the tests themselves are a little bit different um the the whisk and wyatt um are have been um made available on iPads now. So I will do my assessments on iPads um, rather than pen and paper. So if the child will have an iPad and I'll have one and um, kids tend to quite like it. And it, it makes my job as a psychologist much easier because um, I'm not having to faff and try and keep up writing it, everything down. And I'm just sort of tapping and clicking boxes. And when a child responds, it's auto automatic rather than it takes out an element of um, uh, administrative error because, for example, the, the non-verbal reasoning, which is being able to make links between pictures um, 
and uh, patterns and make connections um, without having to speak. Um, the child is just tapping the screen to give their answer, so that's automatically recorded. Next question, we are, um, why are local authority EP reports not specified and quantified? It's so commonplace, yes it is. Is it because they don't get paid as much? It's got nothing to do with how much they're getting paid. Um, actually, the, the local authority contracts with schools, the rate per hour is often the same as, as independent um, psychologists. Um, it is purely down to um, time. Um, the reports are, um, Will be shorter because they they have they can't do as much work so they've got less to write about. Um, I'll be careful what I say here. This is not necessarily the case all the time, but it is possible that because they work for a local authority, um, there may be an unwritten um, expectation that they have to be careful what they write because if they write something in the report, um, then that often results in um, resources. Um, I certainly remember when I worked for local authorities, there was this, I did have it in the back of my mind, there was this pressure. Equally, some local authorities um, try very hard to uh, adapt to the limited time, limited resources they've got, the local authority EP teams, and so they may do less individual work and more project work, they may do more training, they may work with teachers and train up staff and teaching assistants to work with children as groups um, because that's more a more effective use of their time um, but um, the the main reason that um, it, it's sort of less detailed is, is probably down to time and resources and perhaps a little bit of pressure to be careful what, what they write as I'm independent my focus is purely on the child so um, I will sometimes write things that parents don't like, that schools don't like. Um, I will try to write it in a way that um, is not confrontational. Um, but when I say don't like, it can be difficult to hear, it can be difficult to read. Um, but my, I'm not doing anybody any favours if I um, don't sort of state how things are, because then people aren't going to clearly understand, and it, um, it's going to be harder to make sure the right. Uh, provisions are in place for the child. Um, your son's school won't refer to an educational psychologist, even though um, it's been requested um, by the child development team and child and adolescent mental health services CAMS. Um, your son won't write and um, so you're wondering whether to go independent because your son's no longer in school. So if your, if your child's not in school but still on roll, your school have a legal duty of care under the SEN code of practice to do everything they can to try to understand their needs if, if, if they're struggling, if there's concerns. So whilst they may be saying there's no point referring, we won't get to see anybody, that doesn't matter, they still have to at least attempt to make a referral. Um, but if your child is no longer on roll at the school, um, then you can call the local authority EP team yourself. Even if they are still on roll, um, give them a call, have a discussion. Just say you've, you've raised concerns with the Senko, you're really worried. Um, dare I say those that shout the loudest get. And it can be quite daunting and scary as a parent or carer because um, you sort of feel, am I doing the right thing? Is this right? Is, is this wrong? And I think often as parents, you're looking to your your school, particularly the, the SENCOs, the Special Education Needs Coordinators, to guide you. What I would say is there are some fantastic SENCOs who are really experienced, they are passionate, they are amazing, they're knowledgeable. If you've got a SENCO like that in your school, um, you know, focus on building a positive relationship with them and working together um, to help your child. If you are unfortunate and the SENCO at your school either is so overwhelmed and doesn't have the support of their senior leadership team, um, it's quite um, new to the role, so maybe hasn't got a lot of training or experience, um, then you may find that they're sort of putting up brick walls with you. Um, it may be that they just can't cope with the overwhelming number of children have needs in their school, um, so they're putting brick walls up. It may be that they're trying to be honest with you and say, you know, you're not going to get any input. Um, either way, um, if, if that is the case, um, then, you know, contact the local authority EP team yourself and just say, look, I've got a bit of a problem here. Um, I really would like my child to be seeing the school to say no. Um, anything you can suggest. Um, if you want to go independent, um, there is absolutely no um, reason why um, you can't um, 
phone up some independent EPs, get quotes, ask them about what they have to offer, ask them how it will help. Um, you don't have to commit to anything. And most EPs in independent practice will be very happy to either answer questions by email or have a quick chat on the phone um, and talk through about, about what can be of benefit. Because of the limited resources, unfortunately, many families are being forced into paying independently for practitioners. What I would say is, if you do not already have disability living allowance for your child, whilst it is a bit of a nightmare form to fill in, so I've been told, um, it is worth looking into because you can use the money to put towards therapeutic services such as speech, th speech therapy, occupational therapy. You can use the money to put towards assessments from professionals such as psychologists. Um, and your child does not have to have a formal diagnosis for you to access that. Um, and once it's agreed, you don't have to um, get permission for what, what you spend it on. Um, so um, that's something to, to consider. Um, next. Um, Next question, your daughter's been screened for dyslexia, dyscalculia and language processing disorder at school, but the teachers can't use it because the teachers can't diagnose. Okay, mm, okay. the teachers can't diagnose unless they're a specially um, trained assessor um, and um, screeners are, are a screener, okay? They, they don't get the whole picture. They're useful for... Um, a starting point to think about okay should we be referring a child on so if um they the teachers have picked up on a, a, a difficulty for your child then they should be at least requesting a referral to relevant other services um so um whether it's advisory teachers uh, educational psychologists if there's a language processing disorder speech and language therapist um but even though the screener might not have come up with a diagnosis, it should have given them some sort of profile and make sure you've seen a copy of it. Ask them, send you a copy and make sure they explain to you what the different parts of that screener shows. Um, and if there's no diagnosis, but there are certain areas that are a bit weaker, then a really good question to ask is, OK, so there's no formal diagnosis. I understand that. But it's showing that there's a weakness here. So what can we put in place as well to help with that? There's absolutely no reason why they can't um, try to put something in place. In fact, if they are aware that a child has a particular difficulty, then they have a responsibility to try their best to put things in place. But again, you may be faced with, well, we can do this, but we can't do this because of limited funds. Um, uh, again, there are many, many schools, wonderful teachers who really do go above and beyond, particularly for children with special educational needs. Um, but unfortunately, there are some as well who um, just don't seem to get it. Um, so uh, it depends on, on who you're dealing with. But I would certainly be going back and asking them if there were any areas of difficulty identified, um, then what um, what can they do to help? And also, um, if, um, if there are no areas of difficulty identified at school, but you think there's something um, going on, then you can always um, employ an independent educational psychologist yourself. Um, okay, I'm going to take, um, hang on, no, I've read that one. Okay, this is the one here. Um, right, I'm going to take a couple more questions, because um, there's loads here, but what I'll do is, because um, we're going to finish in a, in a couple of minutes, what I will do is I will go through all the questions, and I will um, answer them um, in the comments, I will type them in the comments, and if you are watching this um after um, the, the live is finished um, and you have a question, do type hashtag replay, type the question in, I will come back to you and answer it. Um, the other couple of things I just want to say be before I, I finish with the last couple of questions is um, for those of you that are in my group, um, whether you've just joined, welcome if you have, um, or you've been a member for, for a while, um, I'm, I've discovered this, Facebook have, have got this new facility called Guides, um, and it's absolutely brilliant. And what it's enabling me to do is to set up a, um, a guide. You'll see it at the top of the group under the headings called Guides, and it enables me to focus on particular areas and select the posts from the last couple of years. I think I started this group in 2018. The, the, the really useful posts. So, um, you know, you, you don't, Facebook don't always show you um, the, the information that's put on. Um, so at the, I'm going to be working through them. At the moment, I've got one on um, autism and one on ADHD. So take a look, scroll through. There's just sort of nine or ten posts that, that I think are the really important posts that have gone on with really valuable information. 
Um, and then the other thing to say is I've got some new hub dates coming up. I trialed um, my hubs earlier on um, in the month and they were really successful. I had lots of really positive feedback um, and I was asked to do some more, um, but, but focusing a bit more on um, either a particular topic or a particular um group um in terms of where you are in your process so tomorrow night at eight o'clock i think there are still a couple of spaces available for um for, it's for, for anyone who if you're worried about your child how they're doing at school but you're quite early on in your journey you're not quite sure who your child should see what you should do to be helping them make whether it's at home or what you should be asking school for um they're limited in numbers so we can talk much more in depth about your child and their individual needs um Facebook lives like to great quick questions but sometimes you then have more questions or you it can be helpful to make sure that the answers are really relevant for your child um so you're welcome to join that and then we have other ones coming up on ADHD dyscalculia for people who are much further down the process maybe you're doing EHCPs and tribunals um, and I've also slotted one in for um, supporting under sevens returning to school, looking at those emotional um, issues. So I know that a lot of children at the moment, we're seeing a lot of um, unsettled um, bedtime routines again. Maybe we're getting more tummy aches. Maybe we're bedwetting. Um, so that a lot of anxiety in this sort of lead up to going back to school. And this is not just children with special educational needs. Um, neurotypical children as well. It's really, really common. It's normal for children to present their emotions physically um, but I'm going to do a, a small group hub so that we can look in detail at, at your child and what's going on for them and how you can support them emotionally in preparing for returning to school um, and if um, your child um, if you're worried about your child returning to school um, then um, I have put together a um, there's a post on my on my group and my and my page about what to include in a transition pack to support them um, but if you are really excited for your child to go back to school like me <laughs> um, then bring on you've made it you've been home educating for a week if you're an educator watching this you've been home providing your lessons virtually for um, for months and um, you've parents and carers you've been home educating for months we've got one week left um, so well done you Okay, let's just take a couple more quick questions before we finish. Local authority educational psychologists can't diagnose or didn't get much from it. Um, it's a tricky one because actually, as a qualified educational psychologist, they can diagnose so long as they're maintaining their continuing professional development. It is likely that it is the rule of their local authority um, to say not to diagnose, but actually that's, that's not a, a legal r rule at all. Um, I think that what you can do is go back to them and say that you need to really understand your child's um, strengths and difficulties um, and that um, you want a clear understanding and you want to know if your child's um, presenting uh, pro assessment profile and any observations um, meet the criteria for a diagnosis of dyslexia, dyscalculia, moderate learning difficulties um, and, and, and just push them on that. Um, but um, again, it's more like there's an unwritten rule because they're trying to be careful about what they say because if they make a diagnosis, it may well be that then it means certain resources need to be put in place. Um, it's a really messed up system and I'm sorry when families have to go through it. Um, okay, last question very quickly. Will a private EP assessment be accepted by school rather than a local authority assessment? So. An independent assessment, um, schools cannot um, not accept um, a professional report. It's like if you take your child, your child's broken their leg and they've been to a private hospital and seen a, a private consultant instead of one on the NHS, the school can't not accept that report. They can't say, well, the consultant's recommended crutches, but I'm sorry, it's a private consultant. Your, your child can't have crutches. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it's just the same for educational psychologists. What they can do, and this is what I say to parents and I will say to schools as well, is that if they are concerned about the content of the report, if they don't agree with it, if they have questions, then they are very well within their rights to contact that professional directly and talk to them about it. So I'm always very happy for schools to call me and, and question my reports, talk to me about my reports, if there's something they're concerned about. Um, the reality is if they if they're 
pushing and, and pushing, putting up those barriers saying that they're not going to accept it. It's probably because they're worried about how they're going to be able to put the recommendations in place. But as I said earlier, um, even if the resources side of it is a bit worrying, usually the teachers find it really, really helpful because it's like looking inside the child's brain when you have a detailed assessment. Um, so um, they can't not accept it. In practice, does it happen? Sometimes, yes. It depends on the school, the relationship you have with the school. Um, the ethos of the school comes from senior leadership as to their approach to SEN um, and the, the training and, and skills of, of, of all the staff, really. Um, so um, I would certainly advise you not to let that put you off having an independent assessment if it's a worry, but I would definitely raise it with the, the EP that you choose um, and ask for their advice on how to manage a school that is what is saying that um certainly in in for me if that was the case i'd be wanting to i'd be communicating with the school i'd be sensing from their their form they fill in for me where they're at and if need be i would be having a conversation with the school in advance of the assessment just to try to sort of get them on board um as i said all eps work differently um and just speak to the the ep that's going to be working with your child to find out exactly what they're going to do um one last thing in um the files on my group there is a document um and i'll just tell you what it's called um that gives you some useful questions to ask an educational psychologist um when you're or any professional actually um it is called let's have a look cues <laughs> give me my short handling go cues to ask an ep so if you click on files in the group or scroll down you'll see cues to ask an ep so when you're phoning up and finding out or if it's a local authority ep you can ask them these questions um and the other thing that might be helpful to you is that there's a, a document called a guide to making conversations count for all families um, and these are some really useful questions that you can ask at meetings with your school to help move things forward to, to help um sort of either find out what support can be put in place or to try and move things forward if things are feeling a bit stuck. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I hope it's been helpful. As I said, hashtag replay, type in any other questions if you're watching after live. I'm going to go through and I will answer everybody's questions that I haven't been able to answer so far. Um, and as always, this group is here for you. So the information I put on is, is for you um, to help you. If there's something you'd particularly like, um, please do ask for it. If you've got a question, post the question. We have therapists, we have um, uh, education practitioners, and we have parents in similar boats, parents with neurotypical children and neurodiverse children. So if you've got a question, ask it. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people as well as myself would be happy to help. Um, and um, uh, just um, and also just to, to remind you that um, you can also message me if you would like to post anonymously. I'm happy to, to do that for you as well. Thank you. I hope you um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, one more week left. We can do it. Um, and looking forward to things being back to normal as soon as possible. Uh, take care. Bye.